I'm Seth Kligerman. I am uh, Division Chief of Cardiothoracic Radiology, University of California, San Diego. I'm actually leaving in a few weeks to take over as chair at National Jewish in Denver. Um, I'm also a lecturer in cardiac and thoracic imaging at the American Institute of Radiologic Pathology, which is the successor on the radiology side of the radiology course at the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, which I used to lecture at uh, back in the day. Uh, so, you know, working with pathologists at the AFIP, now the uh, Joint Pathology Center, I've been very fortunate to uh, work with some fantastic pathologists. And uh, one of the papers that we wrote many years ago was on the radiologic pathologic correlation of Castleman disease. Uh, so I want to thank uh, the two pathologists on this paper, uh, Terry Franks and Aaron Arabach, as well as one of my uh, mentors in radiology, Jeff Galvin, who's at University of Maryland, who's also done a lot of work in radiology pathology correlation. This is the first case. This is a 34-year-old male with uh, HIV AIDS with a CD4 count of 16 who presented to the ED with worsening shortness of breath. And um, like most patients in the emergency department, he underwent uh, a chest CT. And the chest CT, I'll show the lung windows first. So the lung windows have some interesting findings. Uh, you can see that there are these strikingly peribronchovascular areas of consolidation and surrounding the consolidation of more ill-defined areas of ground glass opacity. And again, these are strikingly peribronchovascular. Um, and as you scroll through the lungs, you see these there throughout the lungs. And then as you get to the lung bases, you start to see some septal thickening. Uh, in the lower lobes, uh, there's some trace effusions, although his heart function, cardiac function was completely normal. Now, when we go to the soft tissue windows, we see something interesting. We see all this really bulky adenopathy, especially in the axillary regions, as well as in the mediastinum. You can see there's a left internal mammary lymph node here. And throughout the mediastinum and hyla, subcrinal space, again, you're seeing this bulky lymphadenopathy. Now, what's interesting about this adenopathy, which uh, should catch the eyes of most uh, radiologists, is how avidly enhancing it is. And I'll show you that in a second. So here is the lung window findings, just showing you some of these areas of peribronchovascular consolidation. And around the periphery of this consolidation are these areas of ground glass opacity. Um, there's a specific term we use for this pattern, not the peribronchovascular consolidation. That is completely nonspecific, and we see in, in various uh, causes. But when you start to see it like this with the surrounding ground glass, we often call that, call that a flame shape appearance, like a flame. Um, and then here you can see the areas of septal thickening. These lines are the areas where there's uh, interlobular septal thickening. And then just to show you, the patient underwent a non-contrast CT a week later. And you can see here on the top right is the non-contrast CT, uh, showing that the nodes, when you give contrast, are active, you know, avidly enhancing. So it's not uncommon to see a little bit of enhancement in lymph nodes, but these are very, very bright. Uh, and all of the lymph nodes throughout the mediastinum, subcrinal space, the hyla, look how enhancing this lymph node is in the left hilum, internal mammary nodes, these are all quite aptly enhancing. Uh, and then here is a coronal, just a thicker slice where you can see how bright the lymph nodes in the axilla uh, really are in this case. So the patient underwent a lymph node biopsy and a bronchoscopic biopsy. And there are really two answers here that you should, you know, kind of bring your, uh, when you're looking at this, you kind of have to fight between if you're a radiologist, but if you, um, you know, are so specialist radiologist, I think, uh, and you, you do a lot of these cases, um, I think you the answer the most the best answer is um, a little better than the other answer that is possible. So, not surprising that this is a lecture on Castleman disease. Um, that the answer is multicentric Castleman disease and Kaposi sarcoma. This is the pathology. Um, I am not a pathologist, so I am going to. I know that these areas, these uh, nodal aggregates are the areas of the lymphoid follicles that you see um, and that the surrounding stroma, within the surrounding stroma, there is this vascular proliferation um, 
And then here is the CD34, which shows supposedly, I was told, areas of KS. But again, I apologize if any of that is correct or if it is completely incorrect. Um, so what is the best um, explanation or the explanation for the answer being multicentric calcium disease with uh, Kaposi's sarcoma or Kaposi's, um, depending on which country you're from. But, uh, well, we know that people with lymphadenopathy, with HIV AIDS, when they get, you know, diffuse lymphadenopathy, we know there's a risk for patients developing non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, why would I think multicentral Kasman disease versus non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? When you're seeing avidly enhancing lymph nodes, you should you should think of multicentral Kasman disease. Now, could this still be non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? Absolutely. We know that in sometimes non-Hodgkin's lymphoma uh, can enhance. This degree of enhancement is a little atypical, but we also know that um, patients with uh, multicentral Kasman disease, uh, you know, these cases will often degenerate into an aggressive lymphoma. Uh, so, you know. The first part of the answer, I mean, it, it could be NHL or multicentric. We know non-Hodgkin's is much more common, but it really is the parenchymal findings. And just one thing about lymph nodes, you know, why not infection? You know, infection, it's not going to give you symmetric lymphadenopathy like this throughout the thorax. It, and this patient also had abdominal lymphadenopathy. It, it's just not going to do that. Infection is going to be asymmetric. It's going to be bulky on one side. It really isn't going to be this, you know, symmetric throughout the axilla, mediastinum, and hilum. But the real differentiation between non-Hodgkin's lymphoma with parenchymal lymphoma, which definitely can happen, uh, versus multicentric calcium disease and uh, Kaposi's sarcoma is, again, these parenchymal findings of these peribronchovascular. Now, both lymphoma and Kaposi's give you peribronchovascular abnormalities, but the appearance of the peribronchovascular abnormalities are quite different. And again, very subtle if you, if you don't uh, do this. Uh, on a daily basis. So in Kaposi's, it has this very characteristic ill-defined spreading along the uh, bronchovascular bundle. And then as it kind of extends outwards, you often see ground glass surrounding the areas of abnormality. And I'll show you cases of what um, parenchymal lymphoma looks like. Now, if you didn't use intravenous contrast, it would be very difficult to make this diagnosis. You would just think lymphoma. And again, it really takes a biopsy to differentiate between multicentral Kasman disease and uh, lymphoma. So the, again, the, the parenchymal findings really help you um, differentiate. And we know that both multicentric Kasman disease and Kaposi sarcoma are related to HHV-8 infection. And there's one paper I found online, the first paper that said up to 70% of patients um, with uh, uh, multicentral Kasman disease will have uh, Kaposi's sarcoma in nodes or in uh, elsewhere uh, at the time of diagnosis. And this is what happened about a year later, and this is more fulminant uh, Kaposi's. Um, he's got extensive abnormality here, increased thickening of the peribronchovascular interstitium, increasing ground glass, worsening septal thickening, uh, and the patient again passed away. So why not tuberculosis? Well, again, TB, the, the imaging findings in the lungs really don't look like TB. Uh, the nodes don't look like TB. Here you can see someone with um, primary tuberculosis and you can see the bulky adenopathy you get. It really involves the side of tuberculosis. You can see the right hilum and subcrinal region. The lymph adenopathy also in TB tends to be necrotic and low attenuation, not enhancing like this. You can see the cavity, cavity here. And then if you have hematogenous tuberculosis, you get nodularity, but it's random. It's not, you know, here is, yeah, this is a peribronchovascular nodule, but you don't really have the surrounding ground glass. And there, there are random nodules here. They really don't follow in any distribution. Some are central lobular, some are peribronchovascular, but again, others are just placed anywhere within the secondary unit you know, of the secondary lobule. So uh, T isn't a great answer. The second and the answer that it you you have to kind of differentiate between is is non-Hodgkin's lymphoma with parenchymal lymphoma. So parenchymal lymphoma is peribronchovascular, but it is more nodular. It's more of these very well-defined nodules, and often you will see classically air bronchograms or a bronchus that goes through these areas of nodularity. Again, you can see a bronchus growing through one of these nodules. So. You know, based on the, the nodes, I mean, if you just had the nodes, it's, you know, it's given that non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is just so much more common, it may just be an atypical look for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma or a multicentric calcium disease that degenerated. Uh, but the practical findings, again, this is what lymphoma looks like, not like our uh, Kaposi sarcoma case. 
What about uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma with pneumocystis pneumonia? Well, again, the parenchymal findings really don't look like uh, pneumocystis. This is a, what pneumocystis classically looks like. It's a, this is a 27-year-old transgender patient with HIV, uh, uncontrolled HIV with AIDS, and you can see the diffuse ground glass. There are some areas of lobular sparing, um, and then if you look very closely, it almost look like a, like a mesh framework within the areas of ground glass, which is what we call a crazy paving pattern. And then lastly, here is a patient um, with uh, multicentric Katzman disease and cystis pneumonia. And you could see the avidly enhancing lymph nodes from the Katzman disease, but this patient actually had uh, pneumocystis pneumonia. Again, the ground glass with the crazy paving. And then you can see this one actually had cystic change, which isn't that common, but we do occasionally see with people with uh, multiple episodes of pneumocystis pneumonia. So again, the best answer for that case really was multicentric Katzman disease and Kaposi sarcoma. So let's go to our second case. This is a 34-year-old woman who had uh, really no significant medical history, and the patient presented to the emergency department with a cough, and like everybody who comes to the ED, they get a chest x-ray, and the radiologist astutely picked up that there was something abnormal on the chest x-ray, and the patient uh, initially underwent a non-contrast CT, subsequently after that underwent a contrast CT, and then eventually underwent a PET CT. And you could see three images from that. You could see the non-contrast CT here uh, on the left, the contrast CT in the middle, and the PET CT um, that was done subsequently a little bit later. And the thing you could see here, so I know that, I don't know how much radiology you look at here, is the aorta. This is the pulmonary artery sitting here. It just hasn't come into plane yet. And there's this big bulky mass. It's really kind of in that area of the aortical pulmonary window. Uh, and it's avidly enhancing. So you can see that this here's without contrast, with contrast, almost as bright as the aorta. I mean, very, very avidly enhancing. There's a little punctate calcification. There's some little areas that aren't enhancing, maybe some little vascular areas. Um, and then here is the avidly, uh, the extensive uptake on the uh, FDG PET imaging. And I'm sure many of you said, well, this is a lecture on Castleman disease. It's going to be C unicentric Castleman disease. But actually, believe it or not, that, that wouldn't be what we would think of first. So what we would actually think of first would be given this location, so here's the here's the case here, would be a paraganglioma. So here are four additional different patients with paragangliomas um, in the AP window, kind of some more anterior mediastinum, others more AP window. This is a very, and when I first saw this case, I really said, you know, this looks like a paraganglioma. We all, I mean, I showed it to multiple people. Everyone thought it would be a paraganglioma. Um, and it, it really does have this characteristic appearance and location, even the punctate calcifications, which we could see in paragangliomas. So paragangliomas are uh, avidly enhancing anterior or um, middle mediastinal masses. We know that they occur along the sympathetic chain. Um, you know, a lot of times they're slightly more anterior to the pulmonary artery, but here is a case where we're sitting right in the AP window, like this case here. Uh, now, you often think of uh, systemic hypertension, but actually hypertension and persistent hypertension is only seen in 29% of patients um, with uh, paragangliomas. So it, you don't have to have uh, hypertension. And on imaging, the best study to make the diagnosis is uh, with MIBG. So I-123 MIBG, you know, avid uptake in uh, paragangliomas. So here is this case here on the uh bottom left showing the MIBG uptake, this big bright dot right here corresponds to this middle mediastinal lesion here, the one in the AP window. But always pathology is the gold standard. And again, the, the location of this really is typical for a paraganglioma. However, this was not a paraganglioma. And then just to show you, I, you know, I, I know these are um, nests of glands, I, uh, but again, I'm not even, you would look at this and say this clearly is a paraganglioma, but not me. Um, you know, that's, that's what you guys do. I'm guessing these areas are maybe some vascular channels, but I'm not entirely sure. And one thing I forgot to mention is that uh, paragangliomas will be, uh, have uptake on FDG PET imaging as well. So that also would fit with the diagnosis. Um, 
So what about a parathyroid adenoma? Well, parathyroid adenomas do avidly enhance. There, you can see here, um, you know, when you, this, I first saw this study with uh, this contrast enhanced scan, you can see this very, you know, area of an uptake here, very avidly enhancing area. Uh, but then the question is, well, is it enhancing or is there just a lot of iodine in this inherently? Because here's the thyroid anterior to it. And you can see the thyroid does enhance, but it also has a lot of iodine within it. And then we often see little areas, a little islands of thyroid tissue that may be usually connected to the thyroid, but often ectopic or just directly adjacent to it, but not connected. And most likely you say, well, it's probably just a little bit of ectopic thyroid tissue. But actually this patient had a non-contrast scan a few weeks earlier. And you can see actually this area here that is the parathyroid adenoma is, is very dark while the thyroid still remains bright. So that avid enhancement is more suggestive of parathyroid adenoma. Um, and it turns out she was hypercalcemic, asymptomatic, and then she underwent a Technation's 99 Sestamibi scan to make the diagnosis of parathyroid adenoma. So why not uh, a paraganglioma? Well, a, this is a very unusual location for a paraganglioma. I've seen a lot of paragangliomas and never one up here. They're almost always uh, the in the anterior middle mediastinum where I, I showed the case, rarely in the posterior mediastinum. Again, I've never seen one up here. Usually they're much larger than this. This would be very small for a paraganglioma. And then uh, also the uptake on technetium cyst uh, 99 system MIBI scan. Now the correct answer actually what it turned out to be, but the incorrect answer for this case is unicentric asthma disease. And the question is, well, why isn't it unicentric asthma disease? That's what it is. Well, I, you know, I don't know of a single radiologist who would look at this case and say, oh, the, this, the first thing I would think of is unicentric asthma disease. A is extremely rare. Um, you know, the, the prevalence is less than one in 100,000. Uh, you know, paragangliomas are rare, but e even, you know, at the best estimate or the, you know, the rarest estimate, you're talking one in 10,000, you know, one study said it's one in 6,000. So they're, they're very, uh, a prevalence, you know, it, it, they're very rare. Uh, two, you know, most cases of unicentric asthmatis aren't sitting right here where paragangliomas usually occurs, you know, they're, they're, they can be along the spine and, or the ribs, they could be in the axilla, they could be, you know, elsewhere. Um, you know, in the mediastinum or chest wall. Uh, it's just one of those things where it's almost like the last thing. If you're going to throw uh, something on a differential diagnosis, it's going to be of an av something avidly enhancing. It's just going to be the last thing because it's so rare. And, um, you know, this is the pathology from this case sh showing the, the Kassman disease. Uh, this patient did undergo uh, resection and um, did very did very well, and we know this is a benign proliferation of lymphoid tissue, um, but uh, you know needs to be resected. Now hemangiomas are benign vascular neoplasms, um, also very very rare. Uh, but I've seen a lot more than them than I have. Uh, not a lot more. I've seen more of them than I have uh, Kassman disease, uh, unicentric Kassman disease. You know, mediastinal hemangiomas, again, rare. Uh, like most hemangiomas elsewhere, they're going to show classically, uh, you know, slow peripheral enhancement and fill in over time. Uh, they've been reported, like in this case, to present with recurrent uh, hemothorax. Uh, and uh, so they're not that avid arterial enhancement during the early phase. So, you know, these the phase case I showed you was during early arterial phase, avid enhancement. This one just slowly fills in over time. Plus, this is a PET scan from this case. This would be negative on uh, FDG PET. There would be no uptake because it's it's a benign tumor and there's it's not metabolically active. And then the last one that it's not a good answer is Hodgkin's. Uh, Hodgkin's, I mean, it's common, but usually it's a massive anterior mediastinal mass. Uh, yeah, it can infiltrate into all the um, different compartments of the mediastinum if it gets big enough. You know, the interesting thing about Hodgkin's, and I, I don't understand why, uh, that it can envelop structures and even compress the pulmonary arteries, but it often completely spares mass effect on the SVC. Or if there is mass effect, it's relatively mild. Uh, it's very interesting why that occurs with, with Hodgkin's. Uh, you can see the bulky adenopathy in the chest wall uh, contiguous with the mediastinal mass. This patient has, you know, post-obstructive atelectasis of the left lower lobe. Anyways, you can see what a, what a Hodgkin's just doesn't look like, this avidly enhancing middle mediastinal mass in the AP window.
I want to thank you for your time. I hope uh, you learned something. I know that a lot of pathologists aren't exposed to radiology, and I know a lot of radiologists aren't exposed to pathology, but I have to say some of the most enjoyable moments I've had has been in my pathologist office reviewing you know, strange cases of ILD or cardiac masses or mediastinal masses. It's, it's really enjoyable for me. So um, I hope you enjoyed some of it, but thank you very much.